Hello and welcome to GI Live Academy. I'm James Batchelor, Editor-in-Chief of GameIndustry.biz, and I am a full-on soundtrack nerd, so I have been very much looking forward to this one. We are speaking about many disciplines across the games industry this week, looking at how you can land roles in certain parts of the games industry. Uh, for this session, we're talking about becoming a composer. Now, you may not recognise the faces on the screen around me, uh, but you will almost certainly recognise their music. So, composers, please wave as I introduce you. I am joined today by Grant Kokop. Kokop. Grant Kokop. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a great start. The composer behind almost every rare game you've ever played, yes, including Goldeneye and Banjo Kazooie, please, uh, no, and the Mario and Rabbids games. Uh, in Anzer, the composer behind Bethesda's Fallout games, Dragon Age Origins, and two, so the good ones, uh, and currently working on, among other things, Starfield. Gareth Coker, who created the soundtracks behind Ori and the Blind Forest, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Immortals Phoenix Rising, and this year's Halo Infinite. Brian Dolivera, whose work includes Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Papa and Yo, Sackboy A Big Adventure, and Netflix series The Witcher Nightmare of the Wolf. And Heather Fennerty, who has worked across a mix of TV, film, and games with soundtracks for Indian mobile titles, titles such as Lattice, Hero in the Ocean, Miasma, and Rooftop Brush. Uh, Rooftop Brush, sorry. Thank you all for joining me. As you can tell, it's quite late, therefore my powers of pronunciation are minimal. Um, so this is a good job that you guys are doing a lot more of the talking. Uh, first question for tonight, then. I'd like to ask you each how you got into composing. Grant, I'm going to start with you purely because I already know your story and it still makes me chuckle. Everyone knows my story. I've done it a million times. So, yes, yeah, so I did a music college you know, degree thing and then um, basically just signed on the dole, unemployment benefit straight when I left university, 22, and just played in lots of different bands on guitar and trumpet. Some of them did all right, some of them did terribly. We ended up touring with like, you know, Van Halen and, oh, my teacher under Van Halen, uh, Bon Jovi, gigantic arena tours, and all that kind of thing for about 11 years. Uh, and then it basically all came to a big grand stop as all the bands split up and we all got too old. And I was just back to playing in covers bands in my local pubs for 35 pounds a night. That's what I was doing for, for most of that time. And a mate of mine called Robin Beadland, um, and that, he was a keyboard player that played in some of the local bands that I played for. Uh, said I've got a job. I was like, you know, knowing that I knew you got a job, everyone that I knew just played in bands and sand on the door most of the time. He said, I'm going to go and work for Rare, write music for video games. I was like, that's a job, right? I didn't realise that. So he'd been there about a year and a half. He said, look, Grant, you know, you've been on unemployment benefit for about 11 years, <laughs> which I had been. Uh, he said, you know, don't you think it's time you got a job, you know, to live, live at home with my mother? I said, well, what can I do? He said, why don't you try writing music for video games like I'm doing? And I was terrible at harmony. I failed the harmony exam at college three years out of four. I only scraped by the last year. He said, well, look, you know, he recommended I buy an Atari ST with a Mega RAM, copy of Cubase, uh, you know, I bought a Proteus EMU FX module thing. And I spent about, I spent 1994 sat in my bedroom writing tunes that I thought was appropriate for video games. I played a lot of games at the time. And I sent Rare five cassette tapes over the course of that year and never got a reply. And out of the blue, I got a letter saying, please come and interview. I couldn't believe it. I went down to Rare in the Midlands. Um, David Wise interviewed me on the Friday. And I got a letter saying I got the job on the Monday. So that was that. I couldn't believe it. So I just went to, did have no idea what I was doing. I just thought, well, it's just got me that hard, surely. <laughs> I just like went to Rare and hoped for the best. And so um, and that was it. It was a complete fluke. If Robert had never done it, I'd never done it. I'd still be playing in pubs in Harrogate in uh, North Yorkshire uh, for £35 a night. Nice. Uh, in on, how about yourself? I actually started... Um from writing music for uh, TV and TV, um, like kids programming, I'd say. Um, I wrote hundreds of TV episodes uh, for Power Rangers and uh, Beetleborgs and State of Grace and Escaflone, you name it. Um, and that was during the 90s. Um, but I got contacted by um, an agent in 96, um, asking me if I want to compose music for games. And then I said no. Um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, however, lucky enough, he was very uh, persistent and he kept on calling me. It's like, hey, you know, um, we're recording live orchestras and there are great budgets and stuff. Would you give it a try? And eventually I gave it a try. And after that, I did not look back. Um, from 97, I am I ended up sort of like my kids programming career in 2001 and dedicated myself for uh, mainly games yes i did 
movies here and there and um and trailers but mainly working on games since um full time since 2001 so 20 years nice uh gareth um so i went the music school route and once i graduated i spent probably three or four years in the wilderness doing trailer music short films pretty much any gig i could get my hand on however at the same time uh, i was also quite an active member on a website called moddb.com and i can trace my entire career in games back to that website um moddb is a site where game developers in their spare time or who are out of work go to make mods for games um and i contributed a fair amount of music to various projects and i also had a profile on there um and one day um the director of moon studios who made ori in the blind forest found and ori in the will of the wisps found my profile on the site he liked one track there was just one track that he liked in particular and based on that one track he offered me the chance to do the prototype for the game and if the prototype had a successful pitch then i could score the music for the entire game obviously it did have a successful pitch microsoft were the publisher and obviously one thing has led to another and here we are 12 years later um and yeah i've just wrapped halo infinite so it's uh, it's uh, it's come quite a long way from that initial uh random track on a website and that track was from a student film uh which i have not actually seen since i finished it so yeah <laughs> um. <laughs> nice uh brian yeah so um mine was a bit unusual because um I was both a performing musician, playing all kinds of instruments on stage, and also doing TV on the, you know, on on parallel, doing all these, you know, just the usual as, as everybody else was doing commercials. And then uh, I met this uh, the creator of Papo Nyo, uh, at just very randomly, and we just clicked. And he showed me his game, and he said, "Brian, this is your, this is our story. Is that we have we have a very similar background, being coming from South America." And he just opened it up for me, and he just told me to do what he what I wanted to do with it, and tell my story within within the video game, and that's what I did, and I fell in love with the medium, uh, and ever since uh, since 2009, it's uh, it's become a passion. I, I I find that it's the best of both worlds. You get to be really creative, but also you know with the, there's a vision, and there's the time that you can take to really figure out what that world is, and you create these sound worlds that that end up having a life of their own nice. so and yeah. heather um and yeah heather. sorry uh, i was muted and i was looking at how to put the <laughs> thing back on again um so um i got into well i was i was writing music and, and composers and songwriting from a really early age it was like primary school me and my sister would make up shows and songs and write music for each other we we learned various instruments um, so I'd write duets for us, and um, and then I went down the usual route. I did music degree and and um, then a music for media degree, uh, and after that, similarly into the wilderness and trying to find work any any way I could really. Um, my experience is very much across the board, uh, equally spread over games and theatre and uh, film with some TV in there, uh, some ads, and a little bit of library music. So through various routes, I've found myself doing uh, music for games. Either the music's been licensed for um, for, for an IP, or uh, it's been licensed and then they've called me on to do some more music. Um, or um, uh, I've been involved with a theatre company and then they've gone on to do some interactive work, some immersive interactive work and I, I, so I've gone down that route with them. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's kind of that's kind of the, w the route in there. It's a very sort of convoluted way in of doing lots of different things at the same time that has, that has led to me doing some games. Nice. We've got a good range of stories there. Um, so I, I guess kind of bring, bringing it forward, like how have the the opportunities for composers changed since each of you started like how much i don't know how much work is, is out there because there, there are so so many studios but it feels like there are more games being made now than ever before and all of them generally need music in some form but in terms of like landing a, a job on a game in terms of like making the connections in terms of 
yeah, just basically like securing the role as composer on a specific game. Like, how have the opportunities changed since your career started? Anyone can take this. I'm not going to like start picking on you. <laughs> I mean, I can start because when I started, there were about four video game composers in the world, probably, <laughs> not including me. There was Tommy Tallarico. There was uh, George the Fat Man. Um, there was Jeremy Soule and uh, um, maybe one more. Oh, and, and of course, Marty O'Donnell. Um, and this is pretty much it. The world was open. Um, there was not so much knowledge about that game really needs music, um, nevertheless, serious music. It was the beginning. Um, scrolling forward 20 years today, it's a zoo. Um, basically, there's so many games, so many opportunities. The industry is booming. I did not even dream that this industry will become such a huge um, stage for all kind of music and that it will essentially become a mainstream. And I think that we, we are so fortunate basically to be part of this um, industry that is still growing. All right. Well, I guess I can say, I guess I started different to you guys. I was, I, was a, yeah, I was a staff composer for 12 years, right? So I was nine till five, you know, turn up in the morning and uh, go home at five o'clock and have me tea, you know. So um, I never once thought I'd be actually, as a freelancer, uh, eventually I kind of thought I'd just be at Rare forever because um, I really liked it. Uh, it just kind of, I started to not like it after a while <laughs> for various reasons, you know. Um, and so I left. Um, you know, but I never once thought I'd be able to hack it as a freelancer. Um, it just seemed to be too hit or miss. You know, you can have a great year, you can have a terrible year. You can, have a, you know, you can you can get all five games in it, it, it like it all at once and get none for the next three years. You know, it can be. It's a it's a crazy business. I think so it's a bit seat in your pants. I think you have to have the nerve to to stick it out because everybody that I know, without exception, has had some degree of a downturn where they've not had as much work as they had before. It's not like, you know, it's like uh, the guys at Rare, used to, the guys that run Rare, Steve, uh, Chris Stamper and Tim Stamper used to always say, make hay while the sun shines. And I think it's really true. You know, you know, yeah, I think you can't really afford to turn anything down. You can't say, I haven't got time to do that really. I really need to, do, I, need, I just need to concentrate on this. You can't do that. You have to take on as much work as you possibly can because you might not get any from the next year, you know? <laughs> so, but I do feel like the opportunities are out there. Um, but I do think it's the amount of stuff that I've got from pitching versus the amount of stuff I get from people knowing me for some reason is vastly outweighed by the people that know me or somehow. That pitching thing, I think, is it's super hard. You'll get 80 or 90, 100 composers going for the same thing. How do people pick out the right composer like that? I don't know how they do it. Like I know that Disney do that blind audition thing for, for TV shows and stuff where you'll just all send in music and there's 90 of you probably for each show. The director's just gonna go, I don't know, I'll just pick that guy, I, I know him slightly. You know what I mean? I think it's more like that. So I feel like yeah, that whole networking part of it is as important as being good. I think the talent's half the battle, the other half the battle is definitely the people that you know, that little network you build up from, you, from the years you've been working in the business. So I think opportunity is, is totally out there whether you'll get the chance to have the opportunity, I don't know. I think that's, that's, that's the hard part, right? I mean, I would agree across the board. Um, I would say I would agree with you that the word of mouth and in-person relationships really are the key and working with the same people again and again. A, a large number of the people that I'm working with now, I was working with, you know, 20 years ago. And our relation, we've built up our skills together and we've built up our projects together and we've worked together and we've recommended each other to different uh, people and you know uh, a rising tide lifts uh, lifts all boats and so that's meant that I'll be honest I'm not entirely sure how the opportunities for composers have has changed in the last 20 years simply because the way that I've worked has been with with this pool of people that all know each other and work together 
Um, I would say, in my experience in general, the experience of composing or getting into the business or the or the barriers to it are, are far reduced simply because the equipment uh, is much cheaper now. You can create great sounding music on really cheap equipment and um, that means that it's uh, far more democratic means that many more people have access to uh, that entry level um, but that does also mean that there's far more competition at entry level um, and like you were saying 90 people going for the same job it's very rare that I get a job that I have to blindly pitch for it's either that I've been recommended or somebody's come to me to pitch for it so it's a much smaller pool um uh the other thing that's obviously better um well for various reasons uh, has become better is that remote working is far far more accepted even obviously in the last year or so but even before then remote working was uh, in the last five years or so has become a, a realistic um way of working whereas like 15 20 years ago you, you were expected to be in the places with the people mm. at the same time uh, wherever the the local hub was for um, the work that you were looking for. Um, so, yeah, so in-person relationships obviously are invaluable now, but they aren't so much of a necessity is that you can make those online relationships really work for you. I just want to say that I love that Inon nodded at the idea of cheap equipment while sitting in what is clearly a very, very expensive studio. Uh, it's just a bu bunch of lights. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a picture. It's a picture. It's, it's just a, a picture. picture it's exactly. Picture <laughs> That's a Zoom background, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, uh, a lot of you have kind of got experience then um, of composing across different mediums. Like most of you, kind of specialise in games, or certainly have done a lot of work in games. But you know, a, a ton of you have kind of done some films, some TV. Heather, you were talking about like kind of the wide array of stuff that you've been doing you can do like theater and stuff like for those in the audience who who are considering becoming a composer and maybe wanting to kind of um make music for for different formats like uh, different forms of entertainment like what are the differences what are the key differences between composing for games versus composing for other forms of entertainment um heather we'll start okay. with you um well in my experience um when working on game music specifically, I generally find that the developers ask me for specific assets. They ask for a, a number of loops that fulfill a very specific brief and, and some stings that will also take care of uh, some specific actions. Uh, and then they'll take it away and put it together. That's always been my experience with the way that um, uh, the developers have wanted the music. Um, there's not never really been a sense of a complete coherent soundtrack, unfortunately. But you you work the way that the developers want to work. So that's my experience of games. I know that other people's experience of, of game writing might be different to that, but that's mine. Whereas in uh, film, it's obviously it's linear, and the time timing is always the same. So you don't need loops, you don't need sinks, uh, sing, um, stingers, and you don't need to make sure that you you're calling at a specific time for a specific sound to happen that i mean the main differences are, are the obvious ones is the variability of the timings between things so synchronizing with a certain action on one gameplay through will be different to the way that it is the next time you play the game so making sure that the technology calls for that music at the specific time is what makes games specific specifically um different to film however Theatre is very similar to games. The way that I write music for, for theatre, I'll write, um, not a score, but I'll write cues, but then I will chop those cues up into loops and stings and beds and stems, and then I'll layer it in a, a particular um, uh, program that's designed for theatre um, in a similar way that you would uh, in game technology. Uh, so there are there are actually more similar similarities between theatre and especially immersive theatre and interactive theatre that's got to be got to wait for um, audience interaction. There's a lot of similarities between that area of work uh, and uh, and game music. In my I didn't experience. know that. That's in, I didn't know that at all. That's interesting. I, I have no idea that went on. Oh, that's crazy. Right. 
It's the way I do it anyway. I don't know about <laughs> other people. <laughs> Maybe they don't. <laughs> but I do. That's what I do. Um, something uh, that I've, I've I've had the experience of working on um, all yeah, kinds can, of I, different. I don't know if I can hear a uh, grant, uh, by the way, um, I don't, I'm sorry, hopefully I'm not uh, interfering. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, take the stage. Um, so for me, it's um, in a sense, like, I've, I'm very lucky because I work, I get to work on games that are very long, sometimes three, even four years long, uh, like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So uh, creating a game is basically, it becomes part of my life. Um, I'll basically live it and breathe it for all those years. I'll go traveling, I'll immerse myself in the music and really try to create a whole sound world, a, a whole ecosystem of musical languages and sounds and instruments that work within this. And, you know, I usually spend even a year, even two years working this out. And then sort of more towards mid to the end of the, of the production cycle, I create everything at the end. And then it starts getting into the engine uh, you know, and it starts having its own life. So it's a very different cycle for me. And I, it's the closest thing I could, I could sort of like compare it to is, is doing a thesis for, uh, for a musicology degree, because at least with some of these games, because it's, you know, it is kind of like going into this world and, and becoming an expert in this world that you've created yourself and then making it come to life. Can you guys hear me? Nice. Uh, yes. Gareth, <laughs> we can hear you. So you, you go first. Um, so, um, yeah, between uh, Brian and Heather, like you two have both like touched on, you know, there's there's two there's all kinds of ranges of ways you can work in video games. Um, there's going to be the developers that simply want you to hand off a long list of files that are, um, you know, just a list of deliverables, and then you often you can end up saying goodbye to the music, and that's it, and that's absolutely fine. Um, then there's what Brian does, um, which is kind of living with the game for two to three years, which is uh, another method. And I think if you are thinking about getting into games, you definitely should spend as much time with the developer as possible at the beginning because uh, you, you might not be in sync with exactly how they want to work. You might be fine, like, because as, as um, Grant said, you can't really afford to say uh, no to anything. So you might just be like, okay, I'm going to do whatever they ask. Um, but equally, I would say that if, if you are thinking about getting into games, I feel like you should have a core understanding of like what it is to, to play a game. Because I think for the last decade, game players kind of feel the music, but they don't really. But moving into the next decade and beyond... Something I have noticed amongst games is that they, they are way more aware than they used to be about the effect of music on the player. Um, I personally don't think it's going to be enough, especially uh, especially on really large games. I personally don't think it's going to be enough just to supply music for um, for a game anymore and um, hope hope for the. the the best in in terms of like what you're what you're trying to achieve i think there'll be a lot of games with really good music but there's a difference between good music and good game music there's there's a very subtle difference between like I, i've heard tons of games which have like brilliant music but i'm like oh man it didn't sync up quite right um or that was a total missed opportunity and oh if the composer had totally seen that scene exactly how it's played out in the game they would have totally recommended to the developer to to like change it so it hits slightly better and i think moving forward you're going to see because especially because there's a lot of composers coming to the industry who've been playing games since they were like three um and they really 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 have a good understanding of like what it what they think good game music should be and i think people will feel more and more how connected a composer can be to uh sorry how how connected a composer is to a pro is to a project and so you'll still see moving forward composers who are doing what the you know exactly what the developer tells them to do but my hope for the future is that developers work much more closely with composers from a much earlier stage so that the composer can have a much more holistic role in giving the player like the maximum like emotional response from what they get in the game i think that is going to be the differentiator between game um 
good game soundtracks and great game soundtracks moving forward because frankly almost every game has really good music now and so what's going to be the differentiator um and that's that's kind of where i'm coming from i think that um that's actually hitting it right on the head because the way i was working um at least with uh, bethesda was starting about four years before the game goes out or even five years and basically uh, we're starting that's their philosophy we're starting before there is a game even uh there's just a concept and basically what we're doing is we're feeding each other i'm writing music and they're sending me concept art and then i'm going there and we're sitting together and then like we're talking okay that will work here will work there um and then they will play the my music to the artists was actually drawing the game and that's how they basically get connected and vice versa so we're feeding each other it it's a long process but i believe that in the end of the day um it's the right way to do it it's not like a film that you everything is ready and then you score it in three weeks it's a development cycle things change things evolve things develop and you have to be all the time in contact with the studio and you don't have to live in the studio or to work in the studio you could just go there every few months and then spend two days and go over all you know i mean the levels and stuff and see how it works and then make some as long as you are involved enough and you're being respected enough to at least you know sound your opinion um you could make an impact on the game and uh make your music work better inside the game are there any misconceptions that people might have about being a games composer like we've we've talked about how it's trickier than not tricky but like very kind of different to to other mediums so like you know some people may think well you just write music or you might write a loop and that's it that just gets played like any misconceptions that people might have about the actual role um and the creative freedom of being a composer is there anything that you wish you'd known before you started um doing what you do or like wish you'd known before any particular project you worked on uh, i don't know i think that you know your level of creative or freedom is, is like it's like different because it's not always of, of, oh, hang on we're having that thing with hang on we're having that thing oh, yes. where brian can't hear grant yeah. Um, right. uh, Grant, go and Brian. I'll let you know when Brian when Grant is finished. Just like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think the whole creativity thing about writing work, it depends who you work for, right? Some people give you a bit of freedom, some people don't. And I, I really feel the only time composers are truly free is in the concert hall. Like, I really feel lots of time you write whatever the, sorry, the, whatever you, <laughs> they said the, the F bomb there, whatever, you just write whatever you want, right? And it's up to you, right? I feel like when you're working with somebody else as a media composer, you have to write what they want to hear, whatever that is, or they're going to fire you and get somebody else that's going to do it, right? So it's, you know, I think that, so, you know, you get to be friends with your developers, you know, you, a lot of the time you work for the same guys over the years, you know, like I did with the Mario Abbey's guys, I've, I've known them for like six, seven years now. So we're, we're, we're good friends, regardless of what, you know, kind of thing. So, and I do get quite a degree of freedom, but I still feel like there's always that thing where you are a work for hire to somebody else. There's always that thing where you, you can't be absolutely completely free. You can't write whatever you want because they're going to say, I don't like that. Can you change it? And you better get used to it. If you are the kind of composer that goes, just a minute, I'm the composer. You're the creative director. What do you know about music? I know what I'm doing. You're just going to get fired, right? Like, I feel like that's a skill you have to learn early on because you are just going to get fired. You know, you can suggest to think, it would, but I mean, if someone doesn't like the tune you've written, you no know, amount of telling them how great the chord sequence is or how great the melody is, they don't care about that. They don't care about the technicalities of it. It's like, I just don't like it. You just have to write it again, right? Or change it. And I think that some composers don't like doing that. I've, not, I've known a few composers lose gigantic gigs with arguing with the creative director um, about he doesn't know what he's talking about and you do because you're the composer. So I feel like people don't often realise that is part of the equation, that you just don't get to write what you like you get to write what they want you to, that what they want you to write um which you have to be i'm fine with that i think you have to be fine with it 
you have to be able to go, yeah, that's fine. You may, you may disagree with it, think it's the wrong direction, but, you know, that's, that's the nature of the job, right? Um, but like you say, you get, with your established relationships you've had over the years, they know what you sound like, they know what kind of music you write, they're going to expect you to sound a certain way. And so that's why, like Heather was saying, that, you know, people, you know, the people you work with for the last umpteen years, they hire you for that reason, because they like what you do, you know? But when you get that, that new gig where people that you don't, you don't know, I mean, like doing the Mario gig, that was a complete cold call that they just pitched, to, that asked me to do it. It wasn't like I didn't know any of them, so it could have been a disaster. But they were super nice and, you know, super jolly and all that, so it was great. But I feel like, you know, you, it doesn't always happen like that. You can have to write something you're not that, you don't think's right. But you want the money and you want, and you want, to, get, you want to work, then that's what you have to do. You know? I, want to touch, I want to touch on this because um, it, it, it's uh, I can't say too much, but I, I've just been hired <laughs> on on two projects and it's and they're both brand new clients and uh, they I didn't have to pitch. They they hired me for who I am, but I have no prior relationship with these people. And I, I, I wish we could do this panel in like two to three years time so we can find out if Grant is is right. Um, <laughs> but, or at least or, like Grant is right because it's his experience. Um, but like to see if there is a prevailing winds change um, because this these, these two projects are so early in, pre, in pre-production, which by the way, it's just unusual for someone to be brought on that early. I mean, Enon's, Enon's touched on it, but what, what goes on at Bethesda is very unusual. That's that's not the norm, especially at the AAA level, um, at least from what I've heard and from my understanding from talking to other people. Um, and I think um, on the one hand, like, yes, it is a job, but at the same time, uh, I think developers are starting to cotton on that it's like, Hey, we hired you for a reason. Go and do your thing. We trust you. And I think the key about being brought on early is that it gives you time to fail. And if you've got enough of a relationship with these people or they trust you enough, they're like, oh, Gareth will figure it out eventually because he's, you know, he's done a lot of stuff over the last five years. You're, you're, you've, you've got some time to fail. And I'm sure... Maybe maybe everything Enon did on Starfield is absolutely brilliant, but I'm sure there were some failures along the way because that's usually how it is for composers. But may, <laughs> maybe maybe there wasn't. Maybe every single thing you wrote is perfect. Um, but like, I, I guess it's my point. Like, um, I think when you have time to experiment, it gives you a bit more freedom. Grant's right. Like the concert hall is the ultimate freedom. But I think as composers, you're looking for as as long a leash as possible. That's the the, the best way. Because because some gigs uh, are a really ridiculously short leash, uh, and some gigs aren't. Um, by the way, back to the misconception thing. The only other thing I'll be really brief on this: that my favorite, absolute favorite misconception about games composers is that they can't do linear material, which is the most nonsensical thing. Um, <laughs> Oh, game composers can't do film or TV. It's it's like one of the things I hear all the time, and thankfully that's gradually changing. But it's it's still a thing that comes up. Yeah, I gotta say, Gareth, I I totally I totally agree with Gareth about that. I, that whole linear thing really gets me down. And like I kind of feel like all the young directors coming through now in the thirties are all massive games players, right? So it's kind of I think it's getting less. I think the older guys are the ones that are going. You write on the Game Boy, it just goes beep, beep, boop, boop, doesn't it? You know, that's what they think we do. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we spend all our, we spend, how many hours do we all spend doing massive cinematic sequences? Like, if you put them all together in one game, it will make two yeah, movies, movies, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's gigantic. It's like, what do you think these are? Like, you know, like, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. So uh, I, I totally get, but I do feel it's, like you say, I think it is on the change because the younger guys are all massive games players, directors. So I think that we've got a chance, right? <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes we do feel um, that um, in some of the choices that um, studios are making, it's a bit of a popularity contest. And, and obviously, if it's somebody that he's a film com- or she a film composer that are really like hot right now, then they'll chase them, you know, regardless if they are like the perfect fit for the game or no. But just to say, hey, to say that the game producer, hey, I landed you. I don't know, John Williams. Um, it is um, definitely a reoccurring um, phenomena in the in the big studios. We have gotten um, used to see that happening. Uh, thankfully, there are still studios um, 
that um, this is not part of their, um, let's say, uh, requirements or, 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 or considerations. And um, they will just think of like who could do the best job um, for their game. But um, Hollywood phenomena definitely is happening in inside uh, computer games. And it's actually fine because um, it's um, the competition actually uh, makes um, everything, production, budget, level, everything, all in all, better. So I think it is a healthy process, um, but you got to fight, obviously. <laughs> Brian, go for it. Um, I'm a little bit out of context, so I didn't hear all the conversation by, <laughs> by Grant. Uh, um, but yeah, for, for me, I've been very lucky because uh, I've been, since I'm kind of approaching it as an artist, uh, you know, game, develop, uh, game developers like to work with me because of what I bring as an artist. And, you know, being, there is enough of a, of a field of, of, of needs for this that, that it works, actually. And so that's one thing that I would encourage everybody that's getting into it to, to be, that's new to not be shy to show your own voice as a creator. Um, there's, you know, there's so many games, there's so many ways of, of approaching it uh, that, you know, whatever style that you're into, whichever sound that you create, if you, whether you're even ultra niche, it's gonna work. It's gonna really work with, with so many beautiful worlds that people are creating. So yeah, that's, what, that's one, my one piece of advice getting into this world at this day of age. Um we've obviously been touching on advice here and there a uh, big one obviously being like kind of networking and, and getting yourself out there getting yourself known um but I kind of wanted to ask like you know because we're starting to run out of time i think um your top tips and kind of ad advice you'd you'd give to people who who are keen to become composer like what is it that they need to do to kind of get noticed to land the job they want to kind of uh, to build those networks like what do they need to do to stand out We'll start with you, Ryan, just in case Grant talks and you can't hear him. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, added to what I was saying, I, w I would say um, really take the time to develop your own sound. And that, by that, I mean, uh, don't just be using the usual stock of virtual instruments. They're great. They're good tools to use. But if you can be using recording as much as you can of things around you, your own playing, create your own sound from scratch, and that is gonna take you a much longer way than you trying to make be a, a, you know, a trick of, uh, of many of, of being able to do all these styles in so many different ways, but not really having a, a very focused sound. So yeah, that's my one piece of advice. It's worked for me, it's gone a very long way. And if, you, if you're able to do that and have a very strong voice as, as an artist and as a creator, when you're in the game and being able to voice your opinion and bring something special to the table, it's, it's gonna really bring you a long way within this world. I'm gonna extend on that. Um, be using your own instruments and doing all that, that is amazing. But one of the things that I wish I had done more at the beginning of my career, just finish your work, man. Like seriously, when you're starting out, you, 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 you start out all of these tracks and random ideas, but uh, it takes commitment and courage to like actually finish a track. I know that everyone here is so experienced and we're so used to finishing tracks, but I think we can all flash back to the beginning of our careers and we're just like, yeah, we got so many ideas, we never actually finished them. And there is nothing more attractive to someone else than telling them, this is what I have done, not what I am working on. Um, if I had a penny, you know, I live in LA, Enon and Grant lives in LA. If we, if we all had a penny for like every time we heard someone say, I'm working on this cool thing, but it doesn't exist yet. That's not interesting. What is interesting is like, oh, here's a bunch of stuff that I have finished. Um, and it's very, it, this sounds really obvious, but at the beginning of your career, it is hard to have the commitment and courage to like actually finish stuff because you don't have the confidence yet. You actually kind of need to just write a lot of music. It, it comes, always comes back to that, you know, you've got to put a thousand hours in before you actually like get, get you know, comfortable with doing something and i feel that's i don't i don't want to say go out and write a thousand hours of music because that's maybe a bit much of an ask but like uh just get stuff done and get get stuff out there and by virtue of that you will end up developing your own voice anyway in the way that brian has described but to do that you have to write 
actually a lot of music um and it's, it, that's so that's something i would just encourage you to do like just get over the hump of starting tracks and actually commit and finish them also i think i'd say that um i'd, say, I'd just say sorry i'd just say that um you know writing lots of music and doing that and just putting it on a website somewhere on youtube isn't probably going to get you anywhere because no one's probably going to hear it like you know that's the problem with it because everybody can do that like that's why i say the networking part even though i hate to do it is the best that, that's what you have to do like you have to get yourself into a space where people are doing the thing that you want to do whatever that is if it's going to game jams or going to conventions or whatever or gdc or whatever it is people aren't going to find your music on the on the on the web by chance it happens occasionally but it's it's mass it's massively unlikely they're not going to find your website. They've never heard of you. You know, so you may have you may have the best music in the world. You may be the you may be the next John Williams. But if no one gets to hear it, no one's going to care, or it's just not going to happen for you. So I think by most composers, we're all introverts that sit in our rooms by ourselves and don't talk to anybody for eight hours a day and don't talk to the wife and kids or the rest of it. You know, like yeah, like we all do, right? And I feel like none of us like to get out there and and try to meet people. I don't like to do it. But I think you have to get used to putting on that kind of face where you can be Mr. Mrs. Happy Jolly person when you're out and about around people and they all think you're great and, and, you know, and they can connect with you. But in actual fact, you're really like this introvert sat in your room, not wanting to talk to anybody ever again, right? And I think that, I remember, I remember what reading, what, oh, years ago I was at Red, I remember typing into the internet, I want to be a film composer and an article by Richard Kraft popped up, who's a very big agent in LA. I mean, all those guys know him. Um, and he, he went through about talking about Danny Elfman, but what, what he did say was, People don't want to deal with that introvert that they can't communicate with. It's too hard to deal with that person. He said, you've got to be used to putting on that happy face, like, like you know, the actor thing, you know, happy, sad thing. You've got to be able to do that for people to, to be able to interact with you. If you're a super introvert, you don't want to talk about anything and it's difficult, it just makes it all the harder. And I think that, that whole process, you, you just have to find a way to not be that, to put, the, put a face on when you're out and about with people you know, that, that that's you, but it isn't really you. And I think that... I think, that I think you absolutely Sorry. have a point there. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make the point that if you are super introverted, um, the, the online route is a way of getting to the point of meeting people in real life where you're not just meeting them for the first time. You will find yourself at, at in-person networking events and meeting people that you don't know. But you can soften that blow by working with the networking strengths that you have if you're great online if you can type better than you can speak then it's worth using those strengths to make it easier to get to the other side of networking that is in person that helps a lot and i think having the online hub where you put your material is so useful to have that central place that you send people to rather than it's maybe a SoundCloud and a YouTube and whatever else the kids are using these days, like Twitch or whatever. Um, rather than it all being separate, finding a way to bring it all together so that when you do meet these people in in person, they have one place to go just to see. It. Or you can even show them on your on your phone whilst you're there. You can have them listen to it if they're if they're up for it. Um, so I would say absolutely, in person is the gold standard. However, there are routes into that that aren't as difficult as it first sounds to an introvert to do that. And also, it gets easier the more you do it. The first time is horrendous. It's a nightmare. Uh, the, the more you do it, the better you get at it. It's a skill. It's something you can learn. You can get better at it. Yeah, just to sum it up, basically, uh, if, if you're a young composer, um, especially if you still don't have a family and you have a lot of time on your hand, I would say be everywhere all the time. It's all a combination, basically. So your Instagram and, you know, your TikTok or your Facebook and whatever, you know, be active there. Um, be mindful, but active. Don't do it too much. And I also always recommend to people to get some advice from professional digital promoter and digital marketing people. They could really help you um, target and like how to do it right how to use the internet right because i saw i'm just seeing so many people using the internet wrong and like i don't need to see all the time composers like 
oh, I'm working on this and this. Oh, I'm just like, you know, just give me like once a week some kind of an update. Give it, it's, it's just like, you know, the balance of how to do it right. And it's so important. <laughs> you, oh, you were saying? Yes. No, that's, no, no, I'm just having a grab the joke. No, no, it's, I think that's totally true. Like, you know, I agree with Heather too. I think you, you have to have the online resource. So, so when you do get the opportunity, you can say, go to here and listen to it. You know, you have, it has to be there, but just having that by itself without the other component of me somehow connecting with other people, it's just going to be with every other thousands and thousands of composers out there in the same, just like they are. And, I, you know, there are thousands of great composers now, without a doubt, like, you know. I just want to do one personal uh, anecdote. Um, one of the orchestrators who I work with now, I hired simply because I randomly found his stuff on YouTube. And in 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. Like, or 15 years ago, it wouldn't have been possible. Like, it, there, there is a lot of content that is discoverable by chance now. So it, it's interesting, because I, I do get where Grant is coming from. Because it's so easy to put your stuff out there, it can get lost in the wilderness. But also, you never know when some random person, or like how the Ori director found me, you, you just you just never know who might be listening. And I found this orchestrator because he'd done an amazing string quartet cover of a piece from Ori, and I've hired him on like seven projects in the last uh, four years, um, and he's really good. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't I wouldn't have kept on hiring him. Um, so um, there's. I think if you've listened to all of our answers, like I think the um, the everywhere all the time is 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 accurate. But also, I think Heather's thing is very very good too because you're what you're getting at, Heather. I think is like if you're going to be active on social media, you should probably be committed to the social media platform that you're most active on. Because I see everyone. I got a Twitter account here, a Facebook account there, an Instagram account. It's impossible unless you have an assistant doing that stuff for you all the time, which I know some composers do. I don't know. I, not for me. Uh, but like I, I like Twitter because it limits the amount of interactivity I can have because it's like you can only have 240 characters. Um, but some people might like Instagram. But I think I think Heather's thing is like if you're going to do it then just be committed to the, the platform that you're promoting yourself on, because that's actually how you build a following. Like there are a lot of people who are using YouTube. Um, there's this, there's this guy, Alex Mukala. He's got this ridiculous YouTube channel and he's got like, he's got more followers than probably the rest of us combined. Um, and that, that's, that I just don't think would have been possible five to 10 years ago. So um, yeah, there's all kinds of platforms out there. Um, and with this ever changing digital world, um, keep your finger on the pulse for what's new. Last question for today, purely because I'm very conscious of how much of your time I'm taking up, and I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, let's end on um, quite an optimistic note, because I think a lot of the advice in this in this sort of panel can sometimes seem quite daunting. The idea of you know building this massive online presence and being everywhere all the time. Well, let's end on a, a much more positive note. Um, what is the best part of being a composer? And then as kind of part of that, what is the the project that you are personally most proud of working on? Like what was the best part of that project? Uh, let's start with you, Brian. So with games, uh, working on Shadow of the Tomb Raider um, was definitely one of the highlights of, of my career. Um, getting to you know spend years coming up with like, what if the Aztecs had lived on throughout all these centuries and what would the music sound like? What's, or, you know, what's that inner character voice that, it, you know, personified by an instrument of Lara's character going through all her journey? And, you know, how does it feel? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? And, and being able to bring it to life uh, within, a, within an interactive world that, that has its own life as well. So that's, that, to me, is fascinating. And there's so many pathways that you can go as a composer and, and create things that... Uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's an open field, and that's what I love about it. There's, there's no one set way of doing things or somebody telling you you have to copy this, you have to do this. Um, if, you, if you're given the, the right uh, space like I did, you're able to just do what you do, and, and magic happens. Sorry, wrong button. <laughs> Sorry, wrong button. Um, yeah, uh, uh, well... 
people pay me to write music for them. What's not to like? And I get to work at home in my studio. It's, it's, it's ideal. It's like what Graham was saying. I don't really have to talk to people for a large stretches of time. I just get to sit and do music. And then all the other crap that comes with running a business, obviously. But that, that part of it is just bloody marvellous. What's not to like about it? Um, there was some, um, what was I going to say? Uh, best parts. The autonomy. So the independence, the autonomy of the schedule, the fact that I get to set my own hours is possibly the best part. Uh, and the opportunities to work on a very wide range of medium projects with lots of different people who have different ways of seeing the world and lots of different ways of telling stories. That's, it's really interesting. There's not, it's very varied. It's never dull. It's sometimes very challenging, but it's never dull. Um, and it, I, you know, I, I don't know what I'm most proud of. I'm really sorry. I just like, I, I like a lot of what I worked on. It's all great. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so there's, there's, there's kind of like two, two things for me. The, um, I think the first thing that the games industry as just as a composer, it's pretty much allowed me to tick off everything I had on my composer bucket list. Um, like I've written all kinds of music. I've recorded everywhere I could possibly want to record at this point. I work with tons of brilliant orchestras. As I'm sure everyone here has, and uh, it's happened in the space of six years, uh, which is crazy. Um, like I, if if you told me that was going to happen um, when I uh, left the Royal Academy of Music, I'd have been like, "You're nuts." Uh, so uh, that. But then on uh, a more personal and emotional level. Uh, for me, like the reason I get out of bed and the reason I become so attached to the games I work on, I'm I'm a very hands-on composer. Like with the wh wh when I'm allowed to be, um, depending on the developer. Um, the reason I get out of bed, we have we have a very unique uh, situation now where we can like watch people react to our games in real time. Um, you can't get that when you're watching a film or a TV. People broadcast themselves playing games, and it. <laughs> if ever I'm feeling down uh then i'm just like or, or like struggling to to write music i just have to go on twitch or youtube uh and see someone playing the end of or in the will of the west i'm like oh yeah i actually kind of knew what i was doing um and uh reminds me that i you know i i, I can do the job but that, like that never gets old to me i i i i guess what i'm trying to say is is uh i enjoy the getting the opportunity to uh emotionally manipulate people for a living <laughs> uh, Grant, let's go with you. Yeah, I'm even going about that. That's great. No, I mean, like you know, you know, for God's sake, living in LA, you know, it's sunny most of the need all the time. You know, apart from the fires, of course. And, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And you know, it's uh, you get like like Heather says, getting setting your own hours is fantastic because I think we all know when we work best. I know I work best in the mornings and the afternoons. I'm a bit sleepy. I can't do bugger all. And then at night time, I have to work for busy. I'll do a bit more. You know, kind of thing. So I think that's a great your own hours is a fantastic thing, you know, and like, you know, for me, you know, getting to do the bloody first Mario game was, I mean, who'd have thought when I started in 95, I'd be writing for Mario for God's sake, like God said, I'd never have believed it. And like, and then when they put Banjo Kazooie into Smash and all that, and that reaction was ridiculous and everyone's crying and all that kind of stuff, you know, like, like God says again, you know, if I, when I'm getting depressed, which is most of the time, you know, if I could, if I kind of, um, I can put on the, the reaction videos to people seeing Banjo and Smash and they're all having a great time and it cheers me up, you know, so, you know, it's like a, you know, that stuff, that's, that, those are once in a lifetime things. I'm sure we've all had those moments. So it's never gonna happen again. It's a once in a lifetime where people go crazy about something. It's like, my God, that was such a moment for me. Am I gonna remember it to the day I die? You know, it's, I think it's a fantastic thing. And for me, most proud of, you know, I guess I did Golden Arts, my first game that did really well. And I was lucky at Rare, you know, a lot of the games I worked on did really well, you know, and I kind of thought that would be it. And I've been lucky to have a few successes <laughs> you know, later on as well, you know, when I went freelance. So. You know, it's brilliant to kind of, it's brilliant just to, 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 to keep going <laughs> and just to manage, you know, it's like, you know, that's a hard part, keeping yourself going, because we all have days when it's like, oh God, it's just, it's just not working, you know, you know, so it's, I think it's, um, it's a brilliant job, don't get me wrong, but, you know, like we've all experienced there's hard times when you don't get as much work or things are going wrong or just all that thing that, that's just normal life, right, I think that everyone gets it. And I kind of, I, I guess... I'm not very arty farty, I'm afraid. I guess you can tell. Um, so, I you know, that, that kind of... I, I look at it as a job, and I really... I, I look at it as... I'm no different to the gardener or the pool person or whatever it is. They just do that. I just do this. 
I'm not a mechanic and it's that's our jobs and that's what I, that's what I have to do to make a living and I and I so I don't I guess I don't consider myself to be any better than anybody else at any job whatever walk of life that is I kind of feel like the blokes out there digging the road up work bloody hard and I'll sit here and funny about with a bit of music you know and you know and oh this is a great thing you know this this is me doing really hard work and they're out really sweating and digging the road up and doing really hard things and I'm just like sat here mucking about you know so you know I it's not lost for me that I'm massively lucky. Uh, I think when we all are to be, to be able to write music and make a living out of it. And, and not only that, but some people actually like it, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's me, I'm afraid. In on final word. Final word. Yes. Uh, it's somewhere between, um, and, or combination of what Gareth and, um, and Heather said, um, it's like, we are very, very privileged to have so many people listen to our music and enjoy our music. It's a huge deal for me that I know that people are listening and enjoying. And just the fact that you are entering every day, this is a studio and you just write things um, and enjoying to do it and get paid for it. So yeah, the combination is priceless. Okay, that is all we have time for. Uh, thank you so much to my panel for joining me today. They've been absolutely brilliant. And uh, thank you to you, dear viewer, for watching this. Uh, if you are watching this and thinking, I'd like to know more about working in games, uh, head over to live.gamesindustry.biz. You can sign up uh, for our GR Live Academy. It's a free event for students. You can chat with industry professionals in our Discord. We've got stuff happening all week. There's plenty more from GI Live Academy to come. Thank you so, so much for joining us.